Well, we'll just kind of uh, mosey along farther in this uh, this geography, this map of, of uh, faith and the map of the life. Uh, for those of you that are that are here uh, for the first time now, we've been considering the, the the geography of faith, that is to say, the story of, of the Old Testament as the map of a human life. And uh, we started out at the first. It's very it's a very specific geography. It has it begins in Egypt. <clears throat> and it begins in slavery. Those two things are essential, those two points, that the, the journey of faith begins in slavery, and it begins in Egypt. The next stage, we consider that uh, the, the, the Red Sea is parted, and the next stop of the next point on the, on the map is the desert of decision. The desert of decision. And that's where we are um, right now, uh, the people have just been led through the Red Sea miraculously by God, sent free from slavery, and then they immediately begin to grumble and murmur against uh, the, the things they lack, they, namely their hunger, they're, they're, they don't have enough food, they don't have enough to drink, and so they start to complain and murmur, uh, and this is a, more or less a constant com uh, companion of their, their journey. They're never satisfied. They keep thinking back to what they had before, and it keeps looking better you might say the more time passes from their time of slavery, the better it looks in retrospect. And their memory plays very big tricks on them and convinces them that life was wonderful back then, especially compared to what it is now. And so they, uh, they even reach the point where they, they uh, build a, a golden idol for themselves and literally say, let's go back to the promised land. Let's go back, pardon me, let's go back to Egypt. Actually, I neglected to say the very basis of this whole thing is the two elements of the promise to Abraham, our father in faith, and those are descendants and land. So uh, those that God takes Abraham out and says, look at the sky, count the stars, and that's how many descendants, if you can count them all, that's how many descendants you'll have. But if you have descendants, you have to have a place to put them, and so God promises him to give him and his descendants the holy land, the promised land. And so their journey, their journey is from slavery to the promised land. And, and now we're at that point, in the, as I said, in the desert of decision, uh, the, the three points will be the, the Egypt, the desert, and the promised land. Uh, we're now in the desert. So the, the, they've been complaining about, about this uh, terrible hunger and thirst, and uh, I said the two comments I made were that uh, that something in us, or pardon me, uh, the, the one I've made so far, I'll make another one pretty soon. The conclusion is that there's something in us that wants to be a slave. It wants to be a slave and wants to go back to having someone else determine my time and my place for me. Because we said that's what the essence of slavery is, is to have your time and place determined by the will of another. Well. It's at this point, uh, we, we, you know, when you read the scriptures, uh, it's, it's somewhat helpful sometimes to, to realize that, uh, to kind of imagine alternative scenarios. Uh, we could imagine that, uh, that uh, God could have led them through the Red Sea and then bingo, right straight across into the Promised Land. It's not that far. It's entirely easy to imagine that he could have did shoot right into the Promised Land. Uh, and this would be, of course, an entirely different story. Uh, and just in terms of efficiency, uh, it would be, you know, make a lot of sense. But no, that is not the, the way it is. And so one wonders, well, why not? What, why, what is the, the point of this, this desert, this, as we know, ultimately 40 years of wandering to get, you know, it's probably from here to Seattle, and less, I'll bet. Uh, 40 years to do that. Well, uh, and so we want to note the, uh, where and when things happen, and what what this next thing we're going to consider here is what is the law of freedom. The law of freedom, and I I, I mentioned that I said our choice of phrases. You notice the way I'm saying this. I want to re I'll repeat it so that I can impress that phrase on your mind because that's the way I always say it to myself. The law of freedom. Uh, we have in our time a sense about law. Well, Pope Benedict it was very big on this. He meant this time and again that, 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 uh, that God is the one who is uh, the enemy of our freedom. He wants to kill. Well, the devil, the, the devil says that to, to Adam and Eve, to Eve in the garden. You know, uh, what do you mean uh, you can't eat from the fruit? 
you, you should, he, he, well, we will, we will die. You, should, you certainly will not die, he says. You'll be as gods. Which is to say that the, the reason God sets this law down for you is to keep you from discovering your freedom. This is an ancient, this is in the first pages of the scripture. This is Satan's b basic message is that God is your enemy. You could be as, you don't have to, you don't have to submit to this, God's law. And so it is, uh, in our time too, we have the idea that in America, I think especially with the, that we should be free to do anything we want. And in fact, we're freer to do anything we want than every, any time in history, as far as I can see, at least on the individual level. But uh, the idea that any kind of law then would be the restriction of our freedom, limitation of our freedom, and that's to be viewed with suspicion. Well, of course, there's a sense in which that's true. But, you know, if I if I can only drive uh, 70 miles an hour, and if I drive four, more than that, I'll, I'll get a ticket. That's a that's a restriction of my freedom to drive 120. But it's reasonable, a reasonable limitation, I would say. And that's what St. Thomas tells us: laws are an act of judgment of reason in view of the, for the, the social good, the common good. But nonetheless, we, we have that deep-seated idea that law is fundamentally limiting us, keeping us from doing what we want and what would be good for you. And it's understandable. But uh, I wanted, that's why, that's why I say that, because the, if, we go into, if we view the, the commandments of God, the law of God, from that perspective, then we're kind of, we're gonna miss the point right off the bat and keep missing it, I would say. And that's why it's helpful to locate this, the giving of the law physically, physically on this map. God could have given the Ten Commandments to the Jews uh, the night of the Passover, when they were still in Egypt. He could have said to them, now listen, you're going to take off on this journey, and, and this, is, this is, if you want me to help you, this is what you better do. Uh, I, can, I can understand, Wouldn't, that makes sense. Or he could have told them right after, right after they got through the Red Sea, just as the waters come crashing down and the Egyptians are all destroyed, and they're standing there in wonderment, he could have said, now you see what I can do. He says, this is what I want you, you better follow these logs if you want to get through this desert. Could have done that. Or he could have waited uh, until they, they're on the verge of entering the Promised Land and give them the, give them the Ten Commandments. So if you go into this land, this is what you better live. There's all these alternate scenarios, but the fact is that it's at this point when they have, have all this uh, murmuring against God for his uh, not giving them enough to eat, not giving them enough to drink. By the way, looking ahead, what is that, what is that suggesting? Hunger and thirst. Complaining to God because we don't have enough to eat or drink. What is what is that looking way way ahead? What does that bring into mind? Huh? What? <laughs> exactly, exactly. All of this is all of this is background to the to the Eucharist. It seems to me. Well, so um, they're complaining and and they've reached the point when they've so despaired of the promise. They've said repeatedly that God has brought them out there to kill them, and uh, that is to say that he's not serious about promising them descendants. And then they say, let's go back to Egypt, which is to say the promised land is not worth waiting for. So they've basically given up, really decidedly given up on the promise of God. And he could certainly give up on that, justifiably. But instead, it's at this point, at this point, that he gives them the law at this point. And to me, that's very, very significant. Uh, uh, because what, what, has, what has happened right before this is that, uh, is that Moses has turned their attention. We said before that they were, they were, they were relying on their memory of Egypt. Remember how their, their memory was guiding them? What Moses done, does now is he sends ahead scouts into the promised land. And so we turn from memory to imagination. Memory to imagination. And let's just read briefly about that little, that little expedition uh, in, in uh, reading number 20. When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, Go up there into the Negev, 
then go up into the hill country, see what the land is like, and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether there are few or many. How is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fortifications? How is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort then to get some of the fruit of the land. So these are very specific instructions and they all relate to things that, uh, as soon as you call that, those words into mind, uh, is it good land or bad land? Well, what, you know, something, the imagination begins to form. What, what, would, what would good land be like? What would bad land be like? But it's in the imagination. It's not seen yet. And uh, how are the cities? Are they like, are they fortified? Or are they, are they like camps? Well, you begin to form this imagination of what it's like up there, all these different things. Is it fat or lean, the, the, the land? Are there trees in it? All these things that they would have to imagine what they're like. So the scouts are set up, and then, now remember, this is the land of freedom. The land of freedom, which they have not yet entered. So what's, what's the report of the scouts, the, the spies that go up there? Uh, we see that in, uh, in reading number 21. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, thus they told him, and said, We went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Well, this is so this is a report from people that have actually seen this. They're not they're not relying on their imagination, they've actually seen it. But of course the people they report to, they're still imagining what, what they're saying. Now, for example, that the people who live on the land are strong. Well, you know, how strong? If, it, if one imagines strength in various different ways, the cities are fortified. How fortified? So the, the, this is kind of vague. So we have different uh, as, uh, attitudes toward the promised land on the part of the scouts. And we have the first, the one attitude is expressed by Caleb in, uh, in number uh, 22, reading number 22. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. So there's a man, the voice of someone that's been there, that's, that knows all that, uh, what just, everything has just been said, and that's seen it with his own eyes, and he very forthrightly says, well, let's go. We, we're, we're quite capable of taking this place. That's one, that's one voice. There's another voice in, uh, in the next reading, uh, number uh, 23. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land for which we have gone and spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. Well, uh, now this is this is quite a different tack, isn't it? Quite a different voice indeed from that of Caleb. Uh, there's one phrase there that's striking. It's a, it's a land that devours its inhabitants. A land that devours its inhabitants. How is that? What, what does that say to the promise of it to Abraham? No descendants. No descendants. Why? Why does? Why are no descendants? Because they're going to kill them. The, the land will devour them, huh? So no, therefore, God is not serious about the, the descendants. What about the second part of the promise? Well, it's a land that devours its inhabitants. What does this, what does this say about the promise? They can't take it. So both, both the whole promise is it's a, it's a rejection of the promise completely. It's a rejection of the, the promise of descendants because they'll get devoured. It's a rejection of the promised land because it'll, it's a land that devours its inhabitants. You see? Follow me? So this, you see how again and again, when the people speak almost unconsciously, 
certainly unselfconsciously, they're rejecting the promise time after time. Time after time, they're rejecting the promise of God. Um, so, um, let's, let's see what uh, the reading number, uh, number 24 now. Yet you are not willing to go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you grumbled in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have made our hearts melt, saying, The people are bigger and taller than we. The cities are large and fortified to, to heaven. And besides, we saw the sons of the Anakim there. So that kind of makes the idea that these cities are really, really fortified. And these people, as one translation puts it, they're giants. They're giants. We can never de defeat them. They're just way too big for us. So it's a, a notice, this is from the book of Deuteronomy. I wanted to deliberately take that this message is not just concentrated in one, but spread throughout. It's, it just reflects faithfully the attitude of the people. And so there's the, there we are. The situation is um, we, the, the people are on the, on the uh, well, the, 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 they're, they're considering going forward to freedom, and they're stuck, stopped in their tracks because they're afraid. And this is the second conclusion I would draw from that. It's not infallible like the first one. The first one was that there's something in us that wants to be a slave. The second is that there is something in us that is afraid to be free, that is afraid of freedom. And it seems to me this is very clear, very clear. The people are afraid to go forward into the land of freedom. They'd rather go back to slavery. And so it invites us to just pause for a second and consider this This is this fear of freedom. And uh, what, what, what could that be? What is it? Uh, what is it that, that the people are afraid of? Afraid of? And thinking about it, we can say this is, a, you've probably heard this phrase before, what, what, what the Israelites had when they crossed the Red Sea and the, and the, re, the sea, sea closed down on the Egyptians, what they had was freedom. Freedom from slavery. Freedom from slavery. But they needed something else, and so do we, and that is freedom for something. What do you do with this freedom from slavery when you're out of slavery? What do you do with it? What's it for? And I think that's the underlying question that's at, that's at, maybe at the, part of it, the base of this murmuring, is that they almost have a sense that they're going to confront this question full bore with the, at the edge of the promised land. Maybe. Because that is, and this this is when I go, I go back now to uh, our own human experience, and uh, the I think, in a way, I talked, I said earlier that our earliest uh, recollections of why we want to go back to the to slavery. Remember, I said to our memory of the womb, our memory of the womb. Well, what about this this business of of a, being afraid to be free? Is it not the case that uh, our experience of, uh, of, of childhood and adolescence particularly is that our parents are tyrants? Our parents are tyrants. Uh, uh, what if, uh, you know, uh, I come, I get, I'm 16 years old, you know, I just turned 16 years old, and I go to my dad and, and say that, uh, you know, uh, I know you had me, uh, wanted me to do this, this and so on the weekend, but. Uh, uh, now that I got my license, uh, Jim and I are driving to the coast uh, uh, tomorrow. We'll be back next Wednesday. I, I don't know about it in your house if you could have asked your dad that, but I know what the answer would have been in mine. <laughs> in fact, that question would never have been raised out of just sheer total fear. You know, the idea that uh, that that I can come and go as I want as a as a child uh, is when you're a child, it's, it's obvious that I can't. You know, that's what. But when you cease to be a child and become more and more an adult, it becomes less obvious that your parents should be telling you where to go and when. In fact, it becomes an experience of tyranny, practically speaking. And so there's this great yearning to, to be free uh, and, and go off to college, for example. 
go off to college where I can stay up till three in the morning if I want, and uh, and I can do all these things with my friends, and, and I don't have to report to anybody. My time and my space is, is my own. Wow, is that going to be great? And so uh, off I go to uh, to uh, uh, this new freedom. Well, I, I'd rather ex I, I, I escape from the tyranny of my parents, and I'm free from that. But then there's this hiatus, this extension in our time of adolescence, huh? when when people just kind of go from one thing to another without being. And here's the word that's at the heart of freedom: responsible. that uh, I have a sense that, you know, this college time, and I, as I say this, I'll just remind you that I became a priest when I was 45 years old, went to seminary when I was 41. There's a lot of time in there when uh, I didn't want to commit myself to be responsible. So uh, this reflection comes not just out of critiquing the younger generation, but literally it's a self-critique above all, above all else. That's it. That's where I got whatever insights, these are worthwhile, they come from the things I've seen in my own life, and that is that that if I if I uh, commit if I really enter fully into the, the promised land of freedom, then I will be responsible. I have to be responsible, and uh, as it occurs to me, not only for my own freedom, but ultimately for the freedom of others, because life doesn't just stop. Life goes on, and uh, if I'm really to be free, and of course now here we get to another aspect of this whole thing that's really suggestive, is for most people, most people until very recently, what what is their experience? <coughs> that most that you you yourselves, what is your basic experience of the promised land in this life? Somebody said it. Married. Exactly. How many of you are married? Well, you know, when I marry people, at least when I was in Medford and worked this way, I would have them, I would have them step, and I'd have them step up when they would take their vows. And I'd say, now step into the promise. And they literally do that. It is literally that. You, you know. When I was ordained deacon at, at St. Mary's in Eugene, I remember standing at the door, <clears throat> before the, at the door, back door of the church, before the, before the ceremony began. And I knew that the next time I was at that door, I would be a different man. I knew that when I came out, I would be promised. Because at one point in the, in the, in the, in the ordination, the bishop, he stand up before the bishop, and, he, and he, in front of all the people, he says, do you renounce marriage for the sake of the kingdom of God? Yes. In that moment, everything changed. And so it is, in a, and, a, and so I've left different. And so it is with couples, it's even more dramatic. You enter from different views, uh, like the man up in the front, the woman from the back. Until that, until they meet in the center, but until they make the promise to each other, they can run with good conscience. But once that promise is made, that everything changes. They become responsible to one another. That is to say, answerable, responsible, able to respond, and consider that they must respond one to another in terms of the promise. And it is the promise that makes the marriage, not the blessing of the priest. The promise of the couple is what, what accomplishes the sacrament. So if that isn't the promised land, I don't know what is the most practical. And if that's the case, that, that this is, and, and, and it's very interesting, isn't it, that we see this great uh, uh, reluctance, to put it mildly, to make that promise. This, the cohabitation, this widespread practice of cohabitation. Why? Because I don't want, I fear responsibility. I fear responsibility. Uh, and, and the reason that marriage is helpful here is because it makes it very clear that if my responsibility will begin small, but may extend to people, I, how many people I don't know. But it's, it's getting into a network of responsibility and I'm going to be responsible to be that way. And that's what freedom is. When I was in Mexico uh, 
1976, I, I came across this, I studied Spanish, I found this little fold card in a, in a book there at a bookstore, and I've always had it ever since. It's uh, just, uh, I'll, I'll say it in Spanish because it's better in Spanish than I'll translate. It's uh, Ser libre es poseerse a sí mismo. Ser libre es poseerse a sí mismo. To be free is to be in possession of yourself. To be free is to be in possession of yourself. And I love that phrase. I, I, it, I've thought of it for all these years, and it, it seems it has proven true as I've tried to think it through. That it's that sense, you know, of when we're when we're when we're in the right place, at the right time, doing the right things. Uh, it's as if we can live, if we can inhabit our own skin. We're, I, I'm, I'm within my own skin. I, I, I was struck by some, you know, prominent some certain uh, politicians and certain public people. You get the sense just from an interview. Uh, with them, uh, whether right or wrong, but you get the sense that this person is comfortable with himself. He's not. He's comfortable with himself. He doesn't. He doesn't feel the need to project some phony uh, persona. He's comfortable. He is in possession of. Him. He may not be a saint necessarily, but fundamentally, he's in possession of himself. And so this this idea that uh, we'll see that, that that's a helpful phrase because we're going to talk about uh, when we talk about going into the promised land. We'll, we'll employ that a bit more. But uh, for right now, it's that idea that, that uh, I'm, I'm here on the outside of the promised land, the spies have gone ahead, and what comes back is this overwhelming report of fear. Too big, can't do it, can't do it. Uh, and so uh, we, one hovers on the, on, the, on the frontier of commitment, you might say, uh, wanders around, wanders around and maybe does uh, good uh, and valuable things but without any sort of ultimate commitment that one can't pull back from. Now, I, I, this seems to me very simple, maybe this is too simple-minded, but uh, it, it, it really, I think, this whole phenomenon of what's happening in marriage is so absolutely fundamental. But it's in, the, 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 and the effects of, are, are so unforeseeable and dangerously unforeseeable that I think it's, it really bears, bears pondering these things in the light of the Word of God, and in the in the importance that marriage has in the Christian vision of life. So there we have this um, this um, this situation of on one hand there's something in us that's afraid of that, that, that wants to go back to slavery, and there's something in us that's afraid to be free, afraid of freedom. Now this point is where the law is given. At this point, the law is given uh, on Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai. And it's, it, 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 in this context that I would describe it as the law of freedom, because what is the point of the law is to get people to go forward to freedom, to not regress into slavery. And, and you, uh, you the, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's hear a little bit about that, first of all, let's just get our set. First of all, in reading number 25, what, is, what does God say about reading in number 25? Now, Israel, hear the statutes and decrees which I am teaching you to observe, that you may live, and may enter in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. All right, that you may live and enter in and take possession of the land. What does that have to do with the promise? What does that what does that touch on? Two to two here we go. I told you we're gonna get sick of this, right? The two aspects are 